that we might hear the voice of God. So let us pray. Oh God, now once again we ask that we would have the knowing of you through your word, that we would all be humbled before our mighty God. You have rescued your people for a new kingdom and an everlasting life, which is in Christ Jesus. Help us to live out that life, even encourage us through this word of this morning time, we do pray in the Lord Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So we're turning to Luke's Gospel, and chapter 12, verses 22 through to 34. That is the passage we are focusing our study on this morning. I am sorry, Espanol, not today. <laughs> but Farsi, yes, we got Farsi. So if you've got your sheep in Farsi, you hopefully follow the message. We're going to think about a story of two kingdoms today. A story of two kingdoms. Life is about a story of two kingdoms. There are, in the end, really, just two kingdoms. There is the kingdom of this world where self is the king, where I am the most important person. And we tend to build for ourselves. That's the kingdom of this world. But there is the kingdom of God, where the Lord Jesus is king. And in this kingdom, we build for God. These are the two kingdoms. If you're not a Christian, you are living for this world. If you are a Christian, you are living for God. You see, if you're living for this world, you are ignoring the other kingdom. You are, as it were, giving all of your attention to the things that you see and hear and smell and touch the things that are of time, the things that are of sense. But you are ignoring the kingdom that lasts forever because this world passes away. And as Christians, we have been rescued from this world. As that passage in Galatians told us, this present evil age, we have been rescued into the kingdom of God. But we're in a vulnerable position because we can so easily be sucked back into the kingdom of this world and lose our fervor for God and our passion to live for him. So which kingdom? Are you devoting yourself to the first position of living for this world is desperate where you are set for destruction. The second position is blessed, but you are vulnerable because you can so easily lose your fervor to live for the blessed Second kingdom, the kingdom of God. So that's our challenge this morning. Our challenge is to get ourselves focused on living in a true and proper way. You see, in the passage, we have verse 22. The Lord Jesus is speaking to his disciples, his followers, and he's addressing them about how they are to live. See, the Lord Jesus from chapter 9 and verse 51 of Luke's gospel is setting himself to go out of this world via the cross, through the cross, 
He is journeying on to glory. And these passages, in many ways, show us what it is to be following such a one who is heading to glory as we follow him as the Lord who was crucified, risen from the dead, and is now in glory. We've been thinking over the last two or three weeks about two things that stop us connecting with God. There are two things that stop us connecting with God, and they are religion and possessions. Started the chapter of chapter uh, 12 about the, the Pharisees. At the end of verse 1, about the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. And that represents religion gone wrong. Religion that does not lead you to God, but gets you nowhere. And there's masses of that in the world. There's masses of that in the world. And then there are possessions, like we thought about last week. The man with his great harvest and possessions, they lead us to focus upon this world and stop us focusing on the eternal world. And there's two things that can keep us from losing out on our focus with God and getting us connected with God. And those two things are, and we thought about them a couple of weeks ago in verses uh, chapter 12, uh, verse 4 to uh, 12, and it is to fear God, respect God, and confess the Lord Jesus Christ as the Spirit is working in our lives. Now we come to the disciples this week, and we're going to see how they are to have a proper attitude to the things of this world, because they are living for another kingdom. Are you living in this world? Yes, you are living in this world. But if you're a Christian, you should not be living for this world. You are living for a better world, an eternal world. So let's think, first of all, we're going to be in uh, verses 22 to uh, 31 to start off with this morning. To have, get our thinking right. Get our thinking right. We want to get our thinking right. Got to get things in perspective as regards to how we view the things of this world. So the Lord Jesus speaks to his disciples. Let's go into the passage in verse 32, verse 20, 22 rather. Lord Jesus says to his disciples, says, don't be anxious about your life, what you will eat, nor about your body, what you will put on. He's saying to them, you know, don't have this overwhelming anxiety and worry that focuses on what you're going to wear and what you're going to eat. Those are the base needs of us in this world, aren't we? Food and clothing. And he goes on then in verse 23 to say, your life is more than these things. Your life is, a, is bigger than what you wear and what you eat. So start to think about these things. There is a bigger issue of life rather than keeping the stuff that keeps you going in this world. You have a soul which has life when it connects with God. So he, gets, he gives these illustrations then, and there are three of them, three of them. And first of all, we come to the ravens, the birds of uh, the air. And the ravens, they haven't got storehouses and barns, but they wake up every morning and they go out and they get food for their bellies. But what do we tend to do as human beings? We're always thinking, I've got to be storing things up. I've got to be protecting. I've got to be preserving. And we're thinking about things that can sort of get us secure in this world. And the Lord Jesus said, just think about the birds. And then he says at the end of verse 24, you're more valuable than the birds. You're a child of God. God takes care of the birds. So 
He'll take care of you, yeah? So trust him. Stop being anxious. And then he says in verse 25, can you add a single hour to your, to your life span by being anxious? Can you? It can alternatively be rendered. Can you add an extra few inches to your height by being anxious? Will it bring it about? You're thinking about it. You're churning it over, I think. And how, oh, I speak to my shame, how we churn things over about how we can get through life and do this for life and that. And the Lord Jesus says to us this morning, verse 27, verse 26, if then you're not able to do as small a thing as that, why are you anxious about this? And then he goes to the lilies and they grow and they neither toil nor spin. They're not in a big stew and a big, a, a, a big panic about where they are going to, uh, how they're going to grow. But they grow and they have a glory and a beauty. Have you ever, May is a good time of year, isn't it? May is a good time of year in the UK because everything is at its freshest. Just go and look at some of the flowers. Let's go and look at some of creation around us. And see, God is doing this. God is bringing forth this beauty, the lily and the grass. The grass is, what does it say there in verse 28? The grass grows today, it's gone tomorrow. And the Lord's taking care of that. And so, 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 so we, we read, how much more will he clothe you? So don't just be overwhelmed by anxiety about these things. Now, this is not saying that, okay, the preacher said to me on Sunday, I don't need to go to work this week. I don't need to uh, get any food for those children. It's not saying that. You just see the birds. They don't sit around when they wake up in the morning. They go out and get it. See, going and getting it is right and proper and is fulfilling your duty. It's the attitude of overwhelming anxiety and overwhelming focus on the things of this world. Get your thinking right. You have a father. You have a God who cares for you. You are a disciple. So he says to them at the end of verse 20, oh, you of little faith. Oh, you of little faith. How do we see little faith? We see little faith when we concentrate on big circumstances rather than our big God. When we concentrate on our big God and have big faith, big circumstances tend to become little circumstances. You've ever woken up in the morning? and you're in a bit of a stir with things going on in your mind, and you start to get before your big God, and then it can all start to seem so much better. Come. And we should be relentlessly uh, doing that. We should look at a passage like this and see the promises of God, his care for us. So let's focus on our big God doesn't mean to take away from the circumstances and struggles of life. But we want to address these things in our lives. So we come to the directed teaching of our Lord Jesus as we're getting our thinking right. And we come to verses 29 to 30. So he says, do not seek what you are to eat and what you are to drink nor be worried. Don't just be thinking about everything of this world. There's a sense in which the food and clothing represent all the things of this world and how easily. I, I, I have to confess, you're looking at a failure with regard to a lot of these things this morning. I, I, I so easily fail with these things and anxiety can take over but God, I trust, is speaking to me and to you. 
that the things of this world should be a concern, but they should not be the overwhelming concern. Because remember, you've got a big God and he cares for you. You have a big God and he cares for you. And how do you know he cares for you? How do you know? How do you know? Calvary's cross declares that he cares for you. You can't doubt it. He sent his son to be your savior who gave everything. So start getting these things going through our minds and thinking. And verse 30, then all the nations of the world, they seek after these things. Could somebody look at your attitudes? Do people at work look at your attitudes and see you're not like everybody else? I'm not talking about crazy, odd behavior here. I'm just talking about the simple attitude of the things around us. That you're not just craving for the things of this world in order that you would get security and status. That's really what people in this world are, 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 are striving for, isn't it? Security and status. That's what drives people in so many ways. In many ways, the war out in Ukraine at the moment is really about security and status. People wanting that, willing to fight for that. And so much of our lives is given over to that. And that is the way of this world. Let's see, Captain. But your father knows you need them. He knows you need them. Okay. Now, this is not just getting the, the, the next big plasma TV or anything like that. This is about the needs that we have. Remember, the needs that we have, the basic need, our father knows. So if you're not getting your big plasma TV, don't complain that your father's not looking after you. Father knows. And the food we receive and the clothing we have is an indication of his care for us. Instead then, verse 31, the thinking of our minds is being outworked. And so here it is. Instead, seek his kingdom. Remember, we're thinking about a story of two kingdoms. It's his kingdom. And the emphasis is on the word his. He is your father who cares for us. Perhaps you've had a father who didn't care for you. And that is very sad. But this father always cares for you. Seek his kingdom. Put him first. Get into the business of putting your God first. Seek him. And you say to me, well, that's all very well. Mr. Philip, the preacher, what's all, how, what is it to seek this kingdom? What is it to seek? Well, basically, when you come a part of a kingdom, yeah, you, you follow the ways of that kingdom, don't you? You learn the ways of that kingdom. You go with the ways of that kingdom. And so if you're seeking the kingdom, Dare I say, you'll be a person who's, who's, who's praying, wanting to be in touch with your father. You'll be studying the word. You'll be wanting to know how this kingdom operates. You'll be desiring, I want the Bible. I want to know. You'll be desiring to tell others about this kingdom. There'll be a heart for evangelism. You'll be desiring world mission because you'll be thinking this kingdom is worthy of worldwide extension and you'll be loving God's people who are a part of that kingdom and you'll be desiring others to come into that kingdom and these are the ways that you will be thinking and you won't be just thinking well if only I can get the next big thing the next thing to make me more secure and get me a bit more status You'll be thinking, I just want God and I want his ways. I want his purposes to be flowed out. And you'll be desiring to be a worshipping and a serving and an obeying person as you flow with this kingdom. So seek this kingdom, devote yourself to this kingdom. And of course, you'll desire the very focus of that kingdom, which is Jesus. The 
oh, Jesus Christ, the very special one to your heart because you know that he gave himself for you. So you'll just want to passionately love him and be for him, the one who gave himself for you. And of course, I have to stop here. If you're not living for this kingdom, you, you, you've made some seriously bad thinking. You may have got religion. You may have got whatever. You may have got a comfortable life in following this world, but you die one day. It all comes to an end. The Christian, they go on to an everlasting, everlasting glory. The glories of this world stop and fade away. In fact, the glories that you glory in at the moment could be all gone tomorrow. The glory of the kingdom of God will never, never fade. So, oh, and he says all these things will be added to you, of course. <laughs> yeah. He said, all these things will be added to you. All the things you fret and all the things that I worry about. Oh, Philip, how foolish you are. He'll add the things that you need. Just focus upon his way and upon his kingdom. And church here, let's address ourselves. That's what we want to be about. We want to be a kingdom-seeking people. Children, this is you as well. It don't, you don't have to get to a certain age. You can be radical and living in this kingdom first, his kingdom first life. So that's your right thinking. Now let's get on to some right acting or right living. That's my second section, right living in verses 32 and 33. Some right living. If we're thinking right, we will live right. Okay, this gets a bit uncomfortable. All right, so are you ready? This gets a bit uncomfortable, but we've got to face it. Okay, all right. Verse 32, fear not. It's, it's a beautiful assurance to start off with. Little flock. Sometimes we feel so small. Sometimes we feel as though we're just like vulnerable sheep and we could be just taken away with a strong wind which comes against the church and comes against us as individual. But the, the Lord says, fear not. Don't, don't have that sort of, that, 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 that anxiety that everything is going to collapse. You are the little flock of God. You may feel little and you may feel you're just sheep, but you are a little flock of God. It is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Our God is not stingy. He's loving to bring you into the kingdom. This morning, there is the love of God in Christ presented to you at the cross of Calvary. And this gracious, kind God says, come into this kingdom, repent of your sin, believe in Christ and come and enjoy. And we Christians say, it's the Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. And I think there's a significance to hearing the. It's not, an, it's not a kingdom amongst many kingdoms. It's the kingdom that matters. The only kingdom that will survive into the everlasting glories that are to come. All other kingdoms pass away. Hear these words from uh, 1 John and chapter chapter um, 2. Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh, the desires of the eyes, the pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. And the world is passing away along with its desires, but whoever does the will of God abides forever if you are a kingdom living person if you are desiring the way of god anna has in many ways this morning come out in public and says i'm for the kingdom and i'm throwing my lot in with this church to show that 
uh, can I say, a remind us all here that as we are the people of God in this church, every contribution that is to help the church take forward the work of God and the word of God is kingdom work. When you're cleaning the building, when you're providing the refreshments, if it's helping forward the word of the Lord going forward to reach people, it's kingdom work. Remember at Grace Tots tomorrow morning, it's kingdom work. And it's God's pleasure to bring us into the kingdom. So it, within, with, with that in mind, we're in this kingdom. Let's make sure. Well, here's where it gets a little bit. Uh, well, take my silver and my gold, not a might would I withhold. Andrew Andrew warned us about some of the implications, and here it hits from that hymn. Sell your possessions and give to the needy. Show by what you do with your property that you're not living for this world. Provide yourselves with money bags that don't grow old, treasure in the heavens that does not fade. No thief will, will, no thief will steal, it, steal it, and no moth will eat it all up. So sell your possessions. So what are we to make of that? What are we to make of that? What are we to do? Well, we, we will make the obvious point that you read in scripture that people had houses and people did have property and they were not condemned for having property. So I'm not going to say, say to you this morning that you've got to well, if you've got a car outside, okay, tomorrow, take it down the garage. You've got to go and sell it, get the money away. I'm not going to be saying that. I'm just going to say to you, you as a child of God should be a giving person. This world is tens along these lines. It's a getting world. I've got to get for me. And it is a keeping world. I got to keep for me. I got to keep. Christians, our tendency is to be a giving people. So we are a selling people. We are thinking, how can I help meet some needs? Notice again, it says needs, not just people's wants, meeting needs. Are we sensitive to needs? And if we are sensitive to needs, are we willing to open our pockets and to provide for those needs? Are we a selling people? Are we willing to say, yes, I will give up something. I will give up that. What happens when you sell? What happens when you sell? You are you are reducing your resources, aren't you? You are reducing. You're saying that need is more important than me keeping this for me. So what I want to drive at in our living is, are we a giving people? Do we have it in our hearts? If you're not a giving person, if you're a getting and a keeping person, that's really, you're just living for the world. So let's be thinking, let's be feeling the challenge to be selling, to be giving, to be helping those that are in need. And then we have this beautiful promise, isn't it? That if you are doing so, you are, you are providing treasure in heaven. You are building up treasure in heaven. You are investing in another world. So how about some investment device this morning? No need to go and look at the Sunday papers and see which stocks and shares to go and invest in them, if that's your interest. This morning, I'm going to give you some investment advice. And it comes from verse 33. Be a giving person. Meeting needs. And invest in the eternal kingdom 
where the treasures will never decay and where the banks will never go bankrupt. This is wisdom. This is real living. Of course, you would be aware that the people who tend to go for all the getting and over the, all the keeping, who are they? They tend to be the most miserable people you meet, don't they? We need to be radically transformed. I need to be radically transformed as regards to what this means. I know we're all in different circumstances financially, uh, and we all have, but, but we all just need to be aware of this. I think those of us who are Christians established in the West need to be particularly aware of this. Are we our giving people? Is it in your prayers? Can I just ask this? Is it in your prayers as you realize you've got money? Is, is there somebody I can help? Are you asking God to reveal to you people that you can help? Okay. I do emphasize that it's needs, though. It's not just some, some scheme or whatever which just takes your money. So uh, that's right living. Right living is to be aware of what God has brought us into and to be giving people, investing in the next world. Let's come finally then. We thought about some right thinking. Get your mind going in the first verses up to verse 20, yeah, verse 31. And then we thought about right living, living the right way. And now I want to think about some right loving, some right loving as we come to our final verse this morning. The scripture simply says instead in verse, uh, verse 34, for where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Where your treasure is, there will be, there will your heart be also. Your treasure and your heart are in the same place. Your treasure is established in a heavenly realm. It indicates you are a person of the kingdom of God who is living in the heavenly realm. And you are one who is having a heart devoted to your God. So how is your loving going? You can tell what people love, can't you? You can tell what people love, can't you? People who love their holidays do what? They have lots of holidays. And people who love their cars, well, they will love their car and they'll show it by giving it all kinds of attention. And people who love their football team will give it lots of attention because their heart is there. You can tell by the way people, where people's treasure is by the way they conduct themselves, can you? What gets you excited? What gets you excited? Generally, what gets you excited is what your heart loves. So where is your heart? Where are your loves? Where are your interests? Where, where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. And of course, we tend to find out as well where people's heart is by how they speak, don't we? What they say. So Luke chapter 6, it says, The good person out the good treasure of his heart produces good and, e produces good, and an evil person out of the evil treasure produces evil. For out of the abundance of the heart, his mouth speaks. Where's your heart? Where are your affections this morning? Are your affections on this one who has loved you so much? So you are living a radical life. The treasure is being stood up in heaven where your God is and where 
this kingdom will ultimately be outworked in all of its wonderful glory. Is your heart there? Is your heart with the kingdom of God? Is your heart with the gospel of God? Is your heart desiring the glory of God? Do you hate it when people blaspheme the name of your God? For where your treasure is, there will be, there will your heart be also. Do some heart examining. Go home perhaps later and stop and take some time, five, ten minutes. Do a bit of heart examination. Where's your heart? Where's your treasure? Because your treasure and your heart will be on the same place. What really is it that is making you move forward in life? So come to conclusion this morning and say, Don't waste your life. Just don't waste your life. Okay? There's a kingdom of this world, and it's offering so much. And you will go away from this place, and if you turn on your TV or you're exposed to any of the media, it will tell you, just live for this world. Live for this world. Live for this world. As I said last week, the advertising industry in particular is based upon that thing. Live for what you can get. God says this morning to do so is foolish because this world passes away. There is the kingdom of God, the kingdom of our father. That is an eternal kingdom. To invest in that kingdom brings eternal rewards. And so uh, we want to be making sure this morning that our hearts are set upon our God, that we have decided and realize that we must get our thinking right so we get our loving right. Get our thinking right so we get our living right and our loving will all be in the right place so that we will be moving forward for our, our God. Oh, dear friends, dear people this morning, I just want you to remember that. What kingdom are you living for? What kingdom are you living for? Make sure it's the kingdom of our God. And then you will have a life that counts for now and for eternity. Let's pray. Father, Father, you know the preacher doesn't want to escape this message this morning. And yet I feel it very uncomfortable, Lord. And I just pray for all of us this morning that we would just really address ourselves before you, that we might come through the hearing of these words into abundant freedom and release into the pursuance of the true kingdom of our God and King. We do pray in the Lord Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's think about Lord Jesus.